Hey guys, I'm Kevin Budashevsky, and this is Hypertension Treatment. So hypertension treatment questions on USMLE and Comlex will often give you a clinical scenario and ask you to determine the etiology or treatment. So the first question you want to ask yourself is whether this is primary hypertension or whether it's secondary hypertension, aka secondary to some other pathology. Primary hypertension is also known as essential hypertension. Even though the exact pathophysiology of the disease is not completely understood, we can still make a therapeutic regimen by changing two factors that determine the blood pressure, which is cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. So all of the drugs that we're going to talk about in this video change either the cardiac output or the vascular resistance, and some have an effect on both. So we can decrease the cardiac output by giving drugs that change venous tone, or blood volume returning to the heart, thereby decreasing preload. We can also give drugs that relax vascular smooth muscle tone, thereby leading to a drop in afterload. We can directly target vascular smooth muscle cells with nitrovasodilators or indirectly inhibit them by decreasing the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or the sympathetic nervous system. Essential hypertension is best thought of as a process of unnecessary sodium retention. And this can be due to inappropriate neurohormonal or renal responses, particularly overactivation of this RAS system. So you guys should always think about this equation when treating primary hypertension. And so getting into the specifics to treat it, we can give diuretics such as hydrochlorothiazide to block sodium reabsorption at the renal tubules as well as decrease water retention. We can also give angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors as well as ARBs in order to decrease angiotensin's vasoconstrictive effects. And additionally, we can give calcium channel blockers that are used to antagonize the vascular smooth muscle vasoconstriction that we talked about on the last slide. These would decrease total peripheral resistance. All right, so now let's talk about some disease-specific states. So how do we treat hypertension in patients with CHF? Your approach to hypertension in a heart failure patient should alleviate any fluid overload with diuretics. Additionally, it should decrease the vasoconstrictive effects of angiotensin with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Additionally, you're going to get beta blockers to many patients with CHF because you want to decrease the chronic beta adrenergic stimulation on the heart and the juxtacle merular apparatus. So can you guys think of which scenario in CHF you would not want to give beta blockers? Well, you're not going to want to use beta blockers in patients with decompensated heart failure. You can imagine that if your cardiac output equals your stroke volume times your heart rate, and you have a really garbage stroke volume, say you have an ejection fraction of 10% or something like that. If you have a really low stroke volume, the only thing maintaining your cardiac output is the heart rate, so you would not want to give beta blockers to those patients. These heart failure patients can also receive aldosterone antagonists, such as spironolactone, and we do this because there are such high circulating levels of aldosterone in their blood. All right, so how do you treat hypertension in patients with diabetes mellitus? Knowing this is really important because a bunch of your patients with hypertension are also going to have diabetes. So first off, what antihypertensive should you use in caution in patients with diabetes? Good, that would be beta blockers. And do you guys know why? Right, they decrease hypoglycemia symptoms. If you need help remembering this, recall that propranolol is a beta blocker used to treat performance anxiety. And try to think of what performance anxiety looks like. So you get shaky, you get nervous, you get sweaty, and you possibly have a tremor. And then think about what hypoglycemia looks like. Same thing. You get shaky, nervous, sweaty, and possibly have a tremor. So you do not want to give beta blockers in these patients to avoid masking those hypoglycemia symptoms. So here is a diagram showing the afferent and efferent arterial of the glomerulus. Remember that high glucose levels lead to non-enzymatic glycosylation of the proteins and lipoproteins that we call advanced glycosylation end products. These bind directly to endothelial cells and limit their normal function and also can lead to an increase in reactive oxidative species. Angiotensin II contributes to this process by reducing perfusion since it causes vasoconstriction that can actually lead to more inflammation. That's why ACE inhibitors are such a big deal in protecting against diabetic nephropathy. Our main goal with these is to decrease the vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial, but can also prevent these pro-inflammatory actions of angiotensin II. Additionally, calcium channel blockers also seem to help relax some of the vascular smooth muscle that's been damaged. Finally, thiazides and beta blockers can also be used. Beta blockers, of course, with caution. All right, so moving on, what two antihypertensive medications should you avoid in patients with asthma? Good, that would be non-selective beta blockers as well as ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, as you guys might remember, has a major side effect of cough, and beta-2 receptors cause bronchial relaxation. 
That's why we give short and long-acting beta agonists to treat asthma, so therefore non-selective beta blockers will block beta-2, inducing the opposite, which would be bronchoconstriction. Not something you want with asthma. Alright, moving on. So what are the considerations we need to remember in treating hypertension in patients who are pregnant? This gives test question writers an opportunity to ask you about the potential teratogenic effects of drugs. So all these antihypertensive drugs cross the placenta, and so you have to know which ones are safe for the fetus to be exposed to. The safe ones can be remembered by the mnemonic, he likes my neonate, for hydralazine, labetalol, methyl dopa, and nifedipine. Hydralazine is safe to use in pregnancy, but why might it not be ideal? Well, as you can see, one of its side effects is fluid retention, and we already have that in pregnancy, and so going with another drug, like maybe methyl dopa, might be a better way to go. So why would labetalol work? Well, labetalol has alpha-1 as well as beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic antagonist activity, which can help preserve blood flow for the uterine arteries and placenta at its best. And this is because a combination of both alpha-1 and beta-2 blockade substantially decreases vascular smooth muscle tone. And remember, in contrast, that beta-1's effect is primarily at the heart. All right, moving on to methyl dopa. So remember that methyl dopa can bind to the alpha-2 receptors on the presynaptic terminal. This agonist activity will lead to a drop in the release of catecholamines to decrease the amount of sympathetic nervous activity, and therefore blood pressure. Finally, nifedipine, not surprisingly, like the other calcium channel blockers, treats hypertension by causing vasodilation. 